Hello, and welcome to The Reason live stream. I'm Zach Weissmuller, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Nick Gillespie. Hey, Nick. Hey, Zach. Uh, good to see you. Hey, good to see you, too. Uh, today, we're talking with Jacob Siegel, uh, a journalist with Tablet Magazine, to discuss his quite remarkable piece on what he's termed the counter disinformation complex. It is a long and detailed essay entitled A Guide to Understanding the Hoax of the Century, 13 Ways of Looking at Disinformation. Um, and it connects to a lot of the themes we've talked about on this show about social media, myths and disinformation, the process of the government job owning companies into policing speech, and the ways that would-be gatekeepers are trying to reassert control over the flow of information in this country. This essay lays out our current predicament in a really compelling and comprehensive way uh, and offers some much needed historical context as well that we'll get into into this conversation. And I'm very excited to discuss it with Jacob today. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, I'm excited too. Thanks for having me. So uh, it's a guide to understanding the hoax of the century. Let's just start with that title. What is the hoax of the century? The hoax is the, the false claim, and I would argue the deliberately false claim, that the United States and indeed uh, all liberal democracies are under a dire existential threat from disinformation. And disinformation needs to be explained here if, uh, if indeed um, you know, our survival is imperiled by disinformation. It's, it's worth taking a moment to consider what that thing is. And in its original form, disinformation was supposed to be a kind of targeted attack by hostile foreign entities who infiltrated the media ecosystems and the social ecosystems of Western liberal democracies. The United States, obviously, during the 2015-2016 uh, campaign and election, but also Great Britain during Brexit, uh, similar arguments were made there. And so this was hostile foreign entities, most notably Russia, uh, infiltrating these societies with deliberately false and deceptive information, disinformation, the, the titular disinformation that was so dangerous in the way it undermined the foundations of electoral legitimacy and liberal democracy itself, that it required a a wartime response and a wartime mobilization, meaning the suspension of due process, of constitutional rights and protections, and the giving over of the political system itself to security agencies and their adjuncts within the administrative bureaucracy so that they could protect us from this disinformation threat mm -hmm which was, you know, like more dangerous than terrorism because it was everywhere at once coming in through our, our very screens and, and iPhones. And so all of this constitutes the hoax because there was no grave threat from disinformation, let alone a existential threat that justified the sort of state of exception that was used to fundamentally re-engineer the political system in the United States, which is what took place. And I want to get into how that all happened, uh, the, the recent history and then the deeper history. But first, before I kick it to Nick for a second, uh, I want to pull up an excerpt from the article to really linger on this term, disinformation. You write, a na as a nation, America not only has learned nothing, it has been deliberately prevented from learning anything while being made to chase after shadows. This is not because Americans are stupid. It's because what has taken place is not a tragedy, but something closer to a crime. Disinformation is both the name of the crime and the means of covering it up, a weapon that doubles as a disguise. Could you just expand on that a little bit? What is the utility of the term disinformation to push forward a sort of new system of governance is kind of what you're arguing in this piece? Well, it's a term that both evokes threat and danger as a, 
as fits its origins mm -hmm. in the world of espionage and the Cold War, while at the same time implicitly encoded in the term is um, that there is a deception, that something is being veiled or obscured. And so the, the word is simply confusing and threatening at the same time. And so it, it is not an accident that disinformation is a, a term that is basically impossible to define in any meaningful way. When you try and when you try and delimit what are the categories of information that count as disinformation, it's basically anything that is uh, counter to the prevailing, um, you know, official sort of uh, ruling party narrative at any given time is disinformation. So to use real examples of this, and and for anybody who thinks I might be uh, being hyperbolic here, you know, one day it could be disinformation to say that, um, you know, to question vaccine efficacy uh, in terms of whether or not vaccines transmit, excuse me, whether or not vaccines prevent the transmission of uh, COVID. That could count as disinformation if it was uh, supposedly being incited, if that claim was being incited or perpetuated by a foreign actor, misinformation, if it was merely domestic actors of their own accord mm. making that claim, um, malinformation once it turned out to be true and yet was still uh, in some sense undermining the, the you know, hygienic policies of the state. So disinformation is... Um, literally has has changed day to day based on uh, sort of what suits the ruling party at any given time. And the word itself, the, the sort of recursive quality of the word itself, where you get caught inside this riddle of what is disinformation mm -hmm. is, I think, part of the point. And it's not an accident that such a confusing term was born in the world of espionage. And this is something that America's leading security, uh, Cold War security officials warned about for decades. George Kennan, I'm talking about hardcore anti-communist Cold Warriors, George mm -hmm. Kennan, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, were warning for decades that the growth of the secrecy bureaucracy within the United States government and the normalization and spread of the tactics of espionage, <clears throat> which were going, as the Cold War went on, were going from being the specialized tools of a specialized cadre of spies and security officials and becoming the sort of operating procedures of, you know, non uh, foreign facing government agencies that as this occurred, the confusions and illusions mm -hmm. inherent in those systems of spying and espionage and deception were going to poison a political system in the United States that's supposed to be based on transparency and self-government. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the 2016 election and maybe into the into 2020 and, and the rise of the COVID regime and whatnot. Um, and then, you know, towards the end of the uh, of, of our time together, we're going to talk more about the Cold War roots and kind of look back at, you know, what happened in post-war America that kind of put this all into play. Um, when you talk about the ruling party, um, you're not talking about the Democrats or the Republicans. You're talking about a, a broader conception of a kind of elite consensus or a managerial consensus. Could you... Talk a little bit about that, you know, and say going into the 2016 election, um, you know, and it seems so far ago, it's not, you know, it obviously isn't that long ago, but it already seems that. And some of the big issues that got wrapped up in this revolved around the the revelations that Hillary Clinton had been keeping as secretary of state, had been keeping a private email server and was kind of sloppy in terms of, you know, what what were personal emails and what were you know, actual official emails, uh, but then also the DNC's emails got uh, got hacked or, uh, you know, and, and it turns out it was, I guess, John Podesta had answered a phishing, uh, you know, query and things came out. 
what so two questions first in going into 2016 what was that ruling party you're talking about kind of suss out what that what comprises that and then let's talk a little bit about the specific moments of disinformation that people think changed the outcome of the 2016 election the, the ruling party um in a sense is less important than the ruling class in America, mm -hmm. I would argue. And I, I don't say that to be pedantic, but, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the United States, because of how it's structured, d has never had a, a single ruling party in the way that other states and political systems are mm -hmm. designed around the idea of a ruling party. China has a ruling party. Right. We can all recognize that. Mm -hmm. In the United States, what you had was the emergence of a a ruling class which had uh, members and representatives in both of the major political parties, the Democrats and the Republicans. I think, you know, famously, I forget who said who said it, whether it was Angela Code Villa, but the the Republicans were the sort of junior members of the ruling party. So mm -hmm. they could belong, but had a sort of second tier role. But the ruling class in the United States is a, a function of forces of centralization that really accelerate in the second half of the 20th century and lead to these hyper consolidated, you know, coastal enclaves and uh, DC corridor and this emergence of a single national monoculture among the credentialed members of a ruling class who share a set of customs and who share a, a set of educational credentials and underlying all that share some foundational premises. But before getting to those premises, it's important to, to distinguish how that's different from the regional aristocracies and regional mm -hmm. elites that have always existed in the United States and, and have existed essentially everywhere um, at all times. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the U.S., always, you know, there was a southern gentry in the U.S. There were right. northeastern manufacturing and financial elites. There were, uh, you know, railroad uh, and and other mm -hmm. um, industry and, and, and developer um uh elites and and uh and a uh, oligarchic uh you know there were periods of oligarchic control at other points in american history but they had a a regional basis that meant that they did not act in concert with one another across the country and meant that they were both responsive to some of the uh, regional and local concerns and were themselves in their own tendencies and orientation, uh, were themselves molded by those regional cultures. Mm -hmm. With the disappearance of the regional culture and the emergence of a national monoculture, in the United States. And, you know, th these are not simply cultural trends that I'm describing. There's an underlying political economic reality to this, where we're talking about the consolidation of wealth and of capital. And we're talking about the, uh, the these sort of national credentialing institutions becoming the most important institutions in the country. You get this single kind of monolithic ruling class. And um, that ruling class is then represented by the ruling party in the United States. And the ruling party is the constellation of agencies and party apparatuses with both Republican and Democratic representation, but also crucially spread across the nominally nonpartisan, non-party affiliated federal bureaucracies and indeed across other institutions that are not even officially part of the federal government, but function as the uh, function as the, the sort of either in the nonprofit and NGO right. sector um, or in the uh, universities to some extent function as sort of extensions of this ruling party. And so to put this in very concrete terms, what does this mean? It means a coordinated uh, effort by uh, one group of people in Americans to declare a monopoly over the political system. It means that when somebody you don't like gets elected, like Donald Trump, somebody who's threatening to your interests, and I should say there are many, many reasons 
one could dislike Donald Trump and could strenuously and, um, you know, vociferously object to his presidency. The difference between that kind of political opposition and the ruling party is twofold. One, it's the degree of consensus across the the ruling class, and it's the use of the federal agencies, the use of the mm-hmm. federal bureaucracy in order to delegitimize an elected president, Donald Trump. And the way that this works, where there is a sort of spontaneously emerging consensus, bottom up on the one hand, which is the cultural consensus among members of the ruling class, nobody needs to tell them yep. Donald Trump is a, is an ogre, is an existential threat. They all feel this viscerally. So there's that element. But that's met at the same time by a top down <laughs> coordinated effort across the agencies. And we see this with the FBI quite plainly. We see this with mm-hmm. the uh, uh, people inside of the FBI who are you know, working on the Trump investigation while exchanging texts about how mm-hmm. they're going to protect democracy by keeping him from getting elected. We see this with the Jim Baker, who was the Uh, one of the lead counsels at the FBI, leaving that job to then take a job as the deputy lead counsel at Twitter just in time so that when the Hunter laptop, Hunter Biden laptop uh, story began to emerge, he was in place as the deputy counsel at Twitter so that he could advise the company against, uh, you know, advise the company to go along with the, 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 you know, requests, uh, mandates essentially from the FBI that they not publicize the story. So that's the, that is the ruling party. Um, right. And so it, it, it is not simply people in the media elite, the academic elite, the cultural elite, uh, you know, certainly, you know, uh, economy, whether it's Silicon Valley or industrial stuff saying, I'm really mad that Donald Trump got elected. It is that Donald Trump's election represents an existential threat to America, to the American experiment, and also often comes with either implications or, or you know, flat out statements that the only way he could have been elected was through a manipulation of the American political system with disinformation and things like that. Yeah, all of that, plus then, um, because the the sort of corollary, a conclusion of that is, because he represents this existential mm-hmm. threat, because he himself uh, used illegitimate means to get elected, disinformation, collusion right. with Vladimir Putin, therefore it is legitimate for us, <coughs> representatives of the ruling party, right. to suspend the normal rules of liberal democracy, of procedural right. Uh, government, suspend those normal official rules, enter into the state of exception where we can spy on the president, you know, where Mm -hmm. where we can uh, push through, collude between federal agencies and private partisan actors like Perkins Coy and Fusion GPS, who are the sort of brokers of the phony steel dossier in order to feed that to the FBI so that we can then feed that into the FISA warrant process so we Mm -hmm. can obtain a warrant to spy on the president of the United States and the members of his campaign. We can break all of these rules for two reasons. And I don't think you can actually separate these reasons out. I mean, I don't think the people doing this could separate these reasons out. They could not Mm -hmm. separate out the illegitimacy, the sort of absolute illegitimacy of Donald Trump on the one hand and the way in which he was a threat to America and their steel, unbreakable conviction that anybody who was not one of them um, was a, a kind of existential threat in right. that way. And and again, this, uh, I mean, we'll talk about this later. This has uh, premonitions in the Cold War and the way that political discourse, uh, you know, kind of was enacted in cultural discourse. But it's not just that they have a legitimate right to do this. They almost have a responsibility um, because otherwise everything's going down the tubes and they they have to. You, you've uh, used the term state of exception a couple of times. Uh, that is a phrase that is, you know, best uh, known or most popular is by Giorgio Agamben, the Italian philosopher, who talked about that, uh, you know, who came to prominence after the 9-11 bombings when 
he talked about how the suspension of civil rights in the global war on terror was deemed necessary in order to preserve a free society. And so he, uh, pulling off of Carl Schmitt, uh, the Nazi German philosopher who talked about how liberal democracies were particularly prone to morphing into kind of authoritarian states, uh, he said, and I think with great power, that um, you know the, the state is almost always looking for a reason to declare a state of exception. And the irony of it or the paradox of it is in order to save a free society, we have to suspend all of the rules that allow it to be a free society in order to preserve it. Um, are you pulling off of Agamben, you know, uh, specifically there? And can you articulate a little bit more about, um, you know, do states of exception, they don't necessarily get uh, declared in Congress or in the press. I mean, they can sometimes, but oftentimes it's a consensus that is kind of under the wire, right? Yeah, I think the thing that gets declared by Congress and the press is the existential threat. So they by once you've sufficiently trumpeted the X threat and you've clear that anybody who participate in the defense against that X threat is themselves now an enemy in the Midian sense of a mm -hmm. friend enemy distinction. The right. press and Congress, they trumpet the threat and the state of exception takes care of Right. I wasn't was not drawing explicit on a gumbin that uh, okay. I'm familiar with his work. I'm especially familiar with post COVID work. They were right. sort of brought him, I think, <laughs> a public attention made him a pariah. Though, among uh, the very people we've uh, talked about this on this program and elsewhere, among the very people who were, you know, when he talked about it in terms of 9 11, they were like, yes, this is exactly right. And then when COVID hit and he's Italian and he was living in Italy and he said, you know what, this is a socially constructed pandemic and panic so that the state can declare a state of exception. And in many cases, his particularly his, you know, left wing academic followers in the U.S. literally said, you, you are nuts. You are crazy. You are insane. Um, yet the analysis works pretty well in both both instances. Listen, I, yeah, I think it's a fascinating question why that occurred, yeah. why, why it, you know, you could see the same thing with sort of uh, grad student Foucaultians mm -hmm. who became the most ardent embracers of the biosurveillance state yeah. after, um, after COVID emerged. And to give a very short answer to what I think is a complicated and thorny question, mm -hmm. it seems to me that it's less about hypocrisy and more about the fact that for most people, their political beliefs are a kind of uh, an, an epiphenomenon of their relationship to power. And it's right. like when you're close to the, you know, in the army, they say, you know, you want to be near the flagpole. Right. And mm -hmm. it's like people want to be near the flagpole. And, and when their party is in power, they justify what their party is doing. Mm -hmm. And and um, mm -hmm. and uh, but I think it's a, it's also a testament to how powerful Agamben's um, critique and, and yeah. ideas were that they've become state of exception feels to me like it's just a, a sort of phrase floating. You know, anybody could grab it out of the discourse at right. this point. There was uh, it. One thing I really appreciate about this article was that uh, a lot of the analysis around What's come out from the Twitter files, uh, you know, Russia Gate in general, the Hunter Biden laptop is it tends to be on the media layer, which is important. And the media plays a, a big role in defining threats and whether, you know, uh, the scope of whether disinformation and misinformation is a threat and a lot of major outlets have certainly leaned into that. In fact, you uh, pulled up a little montage here of uh, articles that, you know, show Donald Trump won because of Facebook, Facebook in crosshairs after election is, uh, uh, is said to question its influence. Russian propaganda effort helps spread fake news during election, experts say. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, you make the case that they, the media is actually not the primary mover or culprit here and that it's uh you you dive into 
the role that let's say intelligence analysts and agencies have have played in pushing this idea that misinformation and disinformation is an existential threat that needs some sort of dramatic intervention. Um, and I want to pull up a clip from one of the most prominent purveyors of that idea and one of the people who we saw on TV a lot throughout the discussion about Russian interference in the 2016 election. And that's former CIA director John Brennan. I'd just like to play this clip yeah. and get your reaction to this clip. And you tell me what you think statements like this from the former CIA director, how they affected the conversation around these issues. Hey, and can I just pipe in? I just want to say before we start, not all Irish Americans, not all <laughs> yeah. Irish Americans, but let's let's run this Brennan clip. OK. Happy to have with us former CIA director John Brennan, who is now an NBC News senior national security and intelligence analyst. Why won't the president Thank you confront saying. Vladimir Putin? Why won't he read the cards and say the things that you say need to be said to Vladimir Putin? Do you believe he's somehow in debt to the president of Russia? I think he's afraid of the president of Russia. Why? Um, well, I think one can speculate as to why, uh, that the Russians may have something on him personally, uh, that they could always roll out and make his life more difficult. What's your reaction to that in retrospect, knowing what we know now? Well, first of all, I did command a rifle company in the uh, Fighting Irish fighting 69th infantry regiment okay. so i am an honorary irishman myself <laughs> and um yeah I, I have two reactions and i i will get to the disinformation thing in a second but the first thing i'll say to come back to the question of the ruling party is that mm -hmm. the the sort of tricked understanding how the ruling party operates in america is that it is because it is uh, run by the perhaps the most untalented incompetent group of people ever assembled in the country's history that they have <laughs> insisted on such a um, insisted on these coercive and monopolistic tactics for controlling the government. I, I mean, I think Brennan is a um, by, by the, the sort of the standard measures of what you would expect from the nation's intelligence chief, phenomenally untalented and unaccomplished where he has excelled is as a party hack, you know, as a, as a, a Soviet or, or Chinese style party hack. And the claim that he is making there, which is that Donald Trump is controlled by or indebted to, or, or somehow under the thumb of Vladimir Putin, and therefore by extension, the Russian security services, is a claim that he is, in many senses, singularly responsible for entering into the official record of American politics when, in one of his last acts as CIA chief, um, he basically uh, singularly orchestrated what was known as the ICA, the Intelligence Community Assessment. So this was the, I believe it came out in January 2017, but it was the first, the seminal uh, Intelligence Community Assessment, which declared that not only did Putin interfere in the 2016 election, but that he had a preference for Donald Trump. What we later found out through classified House testimony um, that, you know, uh, people who had been privy to it uh, spoke about was that rather than being a uh, a statement on representing the opinion of the 17 different intelligence agencies, which is what an ICA is supposed to be, a consensus statement, in other words, that in fact, Brennan himself had handpicked a group of analysts and had personally uh, led the drafting of the ICA that declared that Putin had a preference for Trump and that in doing so, he had excluded the analysis from Russia experts who not only didn't find that credible, but who said that, no, in fact, as Russia experts, they had found that Putin's preference was actually for Hillary Clinton because uh, Putin considered her the more predictable candidate, not that there was any nefarious relationship with Clinton, but simply yeah. that in ways that are quite yeah. easy to understand that he he wanted the sort of stock neoliberal candidate because he could guess what move she was going to make. And so that that was Brennan's doing. 
Um, Brennan, you know, the fact that he left the CIA to immediately become a MSNBC analyst tells you a lot both about Brennan and about MSNBC and the relationship between the media and the intelligence agencies. And the media here is simply providing the amplification system um, for narratives that are originating elsewhere. You know, that's why I I talk about the weakness of the media in relation to these other members of the counter disinformation complex, not because the media doesn't play a critical role in amplifying and enforcing these narratives, but because it doesn't generate these narratives on its own. And therefore, it's not in charge of their final direction and orientation. Okay, if I may uh, just I, I would like to point out that Morning Joe is kind of like the Max's Kansas City or the Studio 54 of the ruling party, right? This is, mm. it's you know not accidental that this happened and on MSNBC and on NBC News and things like that, so. When you are, <clears throat> when you observe this fact pattern uh, around John Brennan and see that he discarded certain information and privileged other information is, is making these very, pointed, well, not pointed, but let's say very broad speculation on national television is your analysis that this is a kind of tunnel vision um, that he can, he, he believes this or that this actually is something more nefarious that this is that it, that he's trying to actually be a disinformation purveyor. Well, two things. So one, I would never accuse somebody of being a disinformation purveyor because I don't use the term in that way. I think the term is deliberately obscuritanist and it's an espionage term and I'm I'm not in the business of espionage. So I'm not accusing anybody of disinformation. I think I think they get things wrong or they get them right. Um, I, look, I don't see any reason to try and impute motive here. I think mm-hmm. that the the facts of the case speak for themselves. What we know about the crafting of the ICA is that Brennan omitted contrary analysis and fa- you should people should go back and read that ICA from 2017 when I when I talk about how untalented he is you know i think sometimes the documents speak louder than these characterizations go read the ica it it establishes nothing it proves nothing it's not well argued it has a 12 page appendix drawing on russia today articles from 2012 it's like a a shoddy nomenclatura kind of document that is a sort of placeholder brennan's willingness to or or interest in transitioning from the cia to talking head on on msnbc to signatory to the false national security official document claiming that the Hunter Biden laptops were disinformation um, speaks for itself. He, he's remarkably consistent on these issues. He's very close, uh, I think, to the people in the Obama world, closer than he is mm-hmm. to the people in the Clinton world, for instance. So he mm-hmm. has clear um, he has clear party connections, which are more important here than ideological uh, ideological convictions. You know, it's like a, a late Soviet thing, not an early Soviet thing. This is not what about... A, what a terrible thing to say to anybody, that they're not even a peak Soviet facsimile, no, right? No, it's it's not peak Soviet. It's, you know, yeah. it's like It's after... Brezhnev. Brezhnev when he let himself go, right? It's He's Brezhnev. not even trimming his eyebrows. So let me, uh, to extend this a little bit more... Uh, you know, one of the things when I was, you know, obviously we all lived through this, but then watching that clip again and preparing for this, it's also to me, it's just staggering it, in the press, uh, you know, in this amplification process. Like, you know, the press didn't have Richard Helms on after, you know, when it came out that he, a former CIA director who had burned, you know, had ordered burned tons of documents that would have shown what the CIA was doing. It wasn't like he showed up in a couple of weeks on, uh, on CBS News or NBC or ABC and was pals with people. And they were like, oh, that's so fascinating. Like you are a speaker of truth. They're the, the kind of righteous antagon- antagonism between the press and government officials in many cases, and this goes to kind of trying to understand the way the ruling 
class kind of functions, you know, that, you know, the, the press will say we're the watchdog of freedom, you know, democracy dies in darkness, all of that kind of stuff. But in fact, they suck up to power and they kind of just repeat or amplify many of their claims without any, uh, you know, critical uh, analysis whatsoever. And let's, uh, Zach, let's look at the clip that you pulled, and this is related to this in a kind of new media intellectual, you know, kind of cloud. Um, people like Sam Harris, the very, you know, who was part of the intellectual dark web once it's once upon a time and now has a phenomenally uh, popular podcast, uh, speaks to a lot of people, you know, who used to, only, he used to only talk about being an atheist. And now he talks about being a psychonaut and being a meditator and also being a, you know, a wise vizier of, you know, existential threats to democracy. Um, let's run a clip of an interview with him with some uh, uh, British uh, blokes, I think, or the, the people behind Trigonometry. Yes. Um, and then, Jacob, would you comment on the mindset that is being evinced by Sam Harris in this discussion of why it was a great goddamn good thing that Twitter and Facebook suppressed the Hunter Biden laptop story in the run up to the 2020 election. So, so my argument is that it was appropriate for Twitter and the heads of big tech and journal and the heads of journalistic organizations to feel that they were in the presence of something like a, a once in a lifetime moral emergency, right? Whereas this is not the same thing as not liking George Bush you know, or not liking John McCain or not liking Mitt Romney for their politics. This was, here's a guy who is capable of anything and we cannot afford to have four more years with this guy, right? And, and, and so, um, so what, what should well-intentioned people do who have a lot of power in these various ways? You know, you're running the New York Times, you're running CNN, you're running Twitter, what should they conspire to do? What do you do with the Hunter Biden laptop story when we already know, we, we know how this played out in 2016 with the Hillary Clinton email you know, press conference. That was the killing blow to her candidacy. It's like a coin toss for me, the Hunter mm -hmm. Biden laptop thing, because I, I do understand how corrosive it is for an institution like the, the New York Times to show obvious bias and inconsistency and dishonesty in how they, it's like they couldn't even frame it honestly. It's not like, <laughs> it, it's not like, it's like the way I would frame it is, uh, listen, I don't care what's in Hunter Biden's, I mean, Hunter Biden, at that point, Hunter Biden literally could have had, had the corpses of children in his basement. I would not have cared. Right. It's like it's, there's nothing. First of all, it's Hunter Biden. Right. It's not it's like it's not Joe Biden. But even if Joe, B like even the, whatever scope of Joe Biden's corruption is like if you if we could just go down that rabbit hole endlessly and, and understand that he's getting kickbacks from Hunter Biden's deals in Ukraine or wherever else. Right. Or China. It is infinitesimal compared to the corruption we know Trump is involved in. Yeah, well, I, listen, I'm thankful, uh, genuinely grateful to Sam Harris for um, he just he lines up so many um, corrupt and and fallacious ideas in a row. And I think very usefully, and this is where, you know, uh, I think he does a real um, public service there is he usefully shows the interrelation between these various kinds of um fallacious and and i think destructive thinking so to take this from the top um here here is a person sam harris whose whole career and reputation was built on being a sort of human truth optimizer right his whole career was that he was the dispassionate objective the, the 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 one who couldn't be swayed by primitive and atavistic beliefs in God or or um, you know an intrinsic uh, moral component in existence. He was above all of those things, 
And what it means in practical terms to be above all of those things um, is to be precisely the kind of technocratic judge of the good that Harris makes himself here. Now, not everybody, not every atheist takes this as far as Harris does, obviously, but um, I do think that it is not an accident that the that the same Sam Harris who made his name as the great truth engine, as the, the human truth machine, is now very flippantly saying it doesn't matter what the truth is. What matters is the greater good, which, of course, he is in he is in the position to decide, not the American public or voters. No, Sam Harris can tell you. Sam Harris has decided that it doesn't matter what's on Hunter Biden's laptops. It doesn't matter that Twitter and Facebook censored and repressed this. What matters is that he recognizes the grave danger of, of Donald Trump. So here we have a, a very important connection, which is the connection between the kind of underlying, let's call it the the sort of metaphysical layer of the technocratic mind, which he is a supreme representative of on the one hand, and the oligarchic ruling party certainty that it is in the best position to decide whose votes should count, whose votes shouldn't count, what information can be seen, what information can't be seen. Um, I, so I don't think you you should look at this and think, ah, Sam Harris, great truth seeker, Ham, Sam Harris is being a hypocrite here. I don't think it's hypocrisy. I think it's a cop uh, to call that hypocrisy. No, that is a perfectly consistent position for Sam Harris to take. And this is, you know, what what was the Lenin call it? Like the highest form of imperialism. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the highest form of technocracy, the highest form mm -hmm. of the technocratic mind. Sam Harris is the supreme representative of the technocratic mind. And you know, it's also worth thinking about if this was true, if Trump was indeed the danger that Sam Harris and others are suggesting he was that justified everything, why did they have to keep lying about him? Why did they have to make up all these stories? Does he does Sam Harris not know that the Steele dossier was not but a compendium of totally constructed lies sourced to Washington DC think tank employees? Men, much of the nonsense in the Steele dossier didn't it can't, you know, th through the function, not aware of. I mean, so they, they couldn't say Trump is a very bad, he's a very bad president, not fit by the White House. Uh, he is a honors this country. Um, he's a, he's a racist. He's a nativist. You know, there's truth in all of the statements. I just may not, you, you might not agree with them fully, but mm -hmm. enough truth that you could plausibly argue all of those. He's president in America, but even if you say he's in American history, that's still to justify, justify the unilateral pension of constitutional protect around free speech and, and privacy. So it's enough to president ever had to be singular existential threat because that alone fighting party exercising such power as we're necessary to maintain monopoly. Uh, we're getting a little bit of uh, interference there on, on your end, uh, Jacob. The, it's, it's lagging a little bit, but uh, we got most of that. Uh, you know, the, the technocratic aspect is worth, I think, uh, lingering on for a second because that is really what this these technological systems have now enabled the platforms and the people pressuring the platforms to believe that they can really track these trends to a extremely precise level and then like dial things up and down in order mm -hmm. to improve the discourse or keep people from getting hurt. I mean, I think we saw this amped up uh, post pandemic or, or really like reach the next level uh, in the COVID era. But when 
during the during the the Russia Gate era, there was this project, uh, Hamilton sixty eight, and I've pulled a slide from their dashboard. Uh, all the links to this is an archived version, and we we have a link in the description, and it shows you know these are the top hashtags that. Uh, you know, Russian related or Russian influenced accounts are tweeting out. And uh, just to, to, this is the little disclaimer they put on the dashboard that the charts and graphs here display hashtags, topics, URLs promoted by Russian linked influence networks on Twitter. Content is not necessarily produced or created by Russian government operatives, although that is sometimes the case. You know, uh, let me let me jump in there for one yeah, second because do. it's it's important with that disclaimer. OK, so they had a disclaimer on the site mm -hmm. saying these are not all directly linked to Russia. But Clint Watts, the former FBI agent who was the figurehead of Hamilton 68, also wrote a op ed, essentially an article in the Daily Beast or co-wrote an article in the Daily Beast in 2016 that was very influential in establishing the kind of narrative framework of Russian disinformation in which he explicitly argues that there is a convergence between Russian troll accounts and official Russian disinformation accounts and Trumpkins, as he calls right. them. He says that they're becoming indistinguishable. So this the the disclaimer on the Hamilton 68 uh, site is fine as far as it goes and establishing some degree of, I guess, what's intended to be a kind of uh, protection from legal liability in cases of defamation. But it's it's belied by the argument of its own figurehead who wrote explicitly that Trumpkins, whether witting or not, whether deliberately acting as fellow travelers or not, have become indistinguishable from Russian uh, operatives spreading deliberate disinformation. And to, to be clear, that that you know that this was one of the revelations from the Twitter files is that the social media, the the kind of safety and content moderation team recognize that the methodology behind this was totally messed up. And uh, Yo Yoel Roth, I think, was saying, like, we got to call this bullshit out. And mm -hmm. they never did. Um, but I, I mean, do you think that this had any measurable effect on the discourse? Uh, just just having something like this out there, kind of watching, waiting to tag people with the you know Russian linked propaganda meme i think it had a very significant impact as a additional layer of girding in this larger uh narrative structure which was propagating the idea that the u.s was under attack from russian disinformation and that your fellow citizens with whom you disagreed were no longer merely fellow citizens um, but should be seen as extensions of nefarious, illegitimate, hostile forces. So how many people's minds were, I mean, look, I'm sure it was a very big yep. deal for the people who were getting smeared by this. I don't want to, to minimize that, but I don't think that Hamilton 68's analysis on its own uh, changed a lot of people's minds about anything. I think it provided a critical layer of girding in this larger narrative structure so that it could be touted by the Washington Post and the New York Times uh, and various other yeah. publications as happened. And it was quoted, you know, I forget what the, the official, somebody did an official ta tally. It might've been uh, Matt Taibbi, but you know, it was quoted thousands of times. It was written about in glowing terms, not as a uh, partisan <laughs> ruling party operation, but as a patriotic, uh, you know, this was a civil defense kind of thing. And, and the organization behind it, the Alliance for Securing Democracy, which was created immediately after Trump's election as an explicitly anti-Trump um, operation. Yeah. It, but in that environment that people like Brennan helped to foster and, and legitimize by spreading this false narrative about Trump-Russia collusion, you could create a explicitly partisan anti-Trump organization and pass it off as a patriotic, 
uh, right. civic minded organization because people had simply abdicated their response, their, their critical faculties, and, which is what the state of exception is intended to produce. So things right. worked as they were supposed to work. Um, and, and so I, I think that it was both extremely consequential sort of in the aggregate effect, mm. but um, I doubt that um, I doubt that any one Hamilton 68 yeah. hashtag analysis accomplished much in isolation. Yeah. It is kind of fascinating to think about, you know, one of the one of the great fears about Donald Trump as he emerged on the scene and certainly, at, you know, after it became clear that he had won the election in 2016 was that he was a destroyer of norms, that he was going to wreck everything that was good and decent about America, about American history, et cetera, and that his critics time and time again, actually then in the name of preventing him from destroying norms and, and, you know, breaking everything actually went out of their way to do exactly that. Um, you know, by some of the methods that you're talking about here and eroding the line between, you know, in independent media and state action, because, you know, this, this is the, you know, this is the end of the U S as we know it, if we don't stop Trump, so, you know, extreme action is warranted. It's not merely, <clears throat> you know, okay, but it's actually the responsible thing to do. You really, in a, in a way, the paranoid mentality of, you know, what you call the ruling class or the ruling party, um, you have to go back to the Cold War. And, you know, but then it was a couple of people in the Republican Party, somebody like Joe McCarthy, but it was really nut jobs like Robert Welch, the head of the John Birch Society, who was prone to these kinds of global overstatements, you know, that Dwight Eisenhower, the president who had won World War II and was fighting the Cold War, was a, a you know, a, a witting agent of the Soviet Union. He was sidelined. I mean, he was considered a nut job. Here you see it in plain view, an analogous, analogous kind of worldview where your fellow countrymen are not simply mistaken, but they are somehow either wittingly or unwittingly doing the bidding, again, of Russia, which is also kind of fascinating to think about. Um, I want to ask to complicate just a little bit of what you're talking about, or, or rather to discuss the way this played out on social media, particularly Facebook and Twitter, which were the places that, you know, that both suppressed the Hunter Biden uh, laptop story, but more broadly were accused of pumping up Trump. And then, you know, on the right, I mean, this is one of the reasons why so many Republican members of Congress are trying to regulate social media because they keep saying, you know, we've been screwed. We've been screwed. These companies exist to fuck us over and to squelch our voices, to suppress our reach. And yet throughout, you know, the teens and throughout the Trump years, Trump and other conservative voices actually flourished broadly in the culture, but especially on Facebook and Twitter, where it seemed, you know, conservative right wing people who are the target of the de-amplification process that you're talking about and the delegitimation process actually did really well. Does, how do you, how do you kind of, um, you know, figure all of that uh, out? So I think that's exactly right. And I think you, you have just hit on the impetus behind this attempt to seize control over the social media platforms, which is that they benefit the opposition. Hmm. So the, the apparent contradiction is reconciled by the fact that it is the success of Donald Trump and these putative uh, populist elements that produces the counter reaction in the first place that leads the ruling party to decide it can no longer tolerate this degree of autonomy and needs to clamp down and effectively take control over the back end of these platforms. They, they don't do it. Uh, they don't do it all at once. They don't simply nationalize the industries as it were. So it's always an incomplete process and there's always a, a space open for um, these now sort of, uh, you know, unofficially um, uh, illegal is too strong, but uh, unofficially blacklisted parties to still find ways to prosper. And there's an argument to be made that the technology tends to benefit them in a kind of structural way, but, but this is, it's just the, the sequencing is the only, the only place where I would disagree with you. So what I, what I trace in the, in my essay and tablet is a chronology in which first you have the open 
even bombastic embrace as, of the internet as a, a technology of liberation and democracy by people like Donald, excuse me, not Donald Trump, of course, by people like Hillary Clinton um, and uh, Barack Obama, who are touting the benefits of social media in particular as a force for democratization across right. the world, most famously in the case of uh, the Arab Spring, but also with the protests in Iran. Yep. Um, and it, Clinton is the, the head of the Internet Freedom Agenda at the State Department. You know, one of her aides famously compares uh, social media to Che Guevara as a, this revolutionary force. You know, very telling, like the platitudes <laughs> they come up with here, you know. Um, so so it's these same people, the very same people who then declare the Internet uh, the single greatest threat to democracy. What causes this utterly dramatic 180 where they go from touting yeah. the Internet as a great force of democratization to then declaring that we we need to enforce martial law on the Internet, right. lest civ civilization be destroyed. They perceive it as a threat to their own power and uh, continued mandate to rule. And it's as simple as that. Yeah. And they perceive it as a threat because you have this growing populist insurgency you might call it but really the populist insurgency is part of a the populist insurgency you know sort of represented by people like trump and the brexit movement in the uk and but which macron is i mean you know this is yeah i mean you point out it's a global phenomenon and it's it's multi-determined it's, it's but it's if if it was simply donald trump and russia somehow manipulating america you wouldn't be seeing kind of emanations of it in various forms all over the place. Right. We saw that. Um, that if uh, I may, I just wanted to, and I really, this is the worst kind of fan service, but I wanted to say to John McGuire, yes, that, who asked in the comments, this is from a ShopRite checkout uh, from my hometown of Middletown, New Jersey. <laughs> I was visiting her and the cashier said I could have it just yeah. so we know that. Sorry, and I mean we saw that that pivot that you're talking about, Jacob, from a kind of open embrace of the power of the web to spread democracy and American ideals to a real threat in the figure of Hillary Clinton, who, right after the election, basically introduced into the lexicon the concept of fake news, uh, and we have that clip. Best if you could. Just uh, pull that up. Our backstage is going to pull that up. To our One threat in particular that should concern all Americans, Democrats, Republicans, and independents alike, especially those who serve in our Congress. The epidemic of malicious fake news and false propaganda that flooded social media over the past year. It's now clear that so-called fake news can have real-world consequences. This isn't about politics or partisanship. Lives are at risk. Lives of ordinary people just trying to go about their days to do their jobs, contribute to their communities. It's a danger that must be addressed and addressed quickly. So, I mean, I, I do view that as a pretty important turning point in like modern American political history that that speech uh but really you know you as you document very well in this piece the machinery for addressing these issues was starting to be constructed in the obama years uh, around the 2014 era a lot of this you know as so many things do started in our overseas conflicts with isis and now have been brought to the home front could for this latter half of the conversation here, could you delve a little bit into that history um, and also, you know, feel free to bring your personal experience. I know that you were an army intelligence officer uh, and um, just maybe speak to what happened over there and how it was transported over here in the intervening years. Yeah, so, you know, what I refer to as the counter disinformation complex is not simply an apparatus of censorship. And, you know, this is one of the really um, critical points mm -hmm. that I make in this essay and that I think distinguishes my analysis 
from some other people's analysis, including people who I think uh, you know are very insightful, um, but maybe don't see things quite in the same way I do. The counter disinformation complex does not exist to censor. It exists to rule. It exists as its own form of government, which is replacing constitutional democracy. And the way that it's replacing constitutional democracy is by introducing both new rules of governance, and that's where the state of exception comes in, and then new technologies of administration. So we could say, broadly speaking, that the old rule in America um, was one of self-government, broadly speaking, or, or of a, a liberal democracy that favored a, a pluralistic outlook in which the individual was the proper subject of state uh, protections and mm -hmm. that the the function of the government was to protect the rights of the individual within a liberal democratic framework. And obviously there are revisions to that in the course of American history. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, I think a strong argument that there are a succession of republics in America. Right. Um, but, but that was a pretty uh, consistent um, view of the political system in America. Counter disinformation and information regulation as a uh, a the, the sort of foundational philosophical basis of government just replaces that wholesale because it declares that the function of the government is not to protect the rights of the individual. The function of the government is to protect the individual and the clients of the government from external threats. And so it arrogates to itself the sovereignty that once belonged to the individual in nominally in order to protect the individual mm -hmm. from these outside threats, but in reality to protect, uh, protect their own institutional position and, and try and stay in power um, forever. So that's the counter disinformation complex philosophically. Mechanically, it consists of two parts. You might say one part is the surveillance apparatus mm -hmm. and the other part is the uh as a, a a sort of outward facing messaging apparatus so one part spies on the public and the other part messages to the public the part that spies on the public is really born i mean it's really born during the cold war and maybe right. we'll talk more about that later but it experiences a sort of radical growth spurt in the aftermath of 9-11 and during the war on terror. And the critical thing that happens after 9-11, so it, very briefly, you have the growth of the security bureaucracy during the Cold War. And that's that bureaucracy is extremely powerful and it's extremely important, but it does not have access to all the world's information. It's still running analog. Then you have the growth of the internet which is itself, uh, you know, in, in some ways a defense initiative at its inception. Mm -hmm. And after 9-11, the Internet and in particular, the, the sort of crucial Internet platforms and, and later it'll be really the social media platforms begin to operate as direct uh, adjuncts of the national security establishment. And we learn a lot of the, uh, about this during the, from the Snowden revelations, mm -hmm. obviously, but some of it's also happening sort of, it, it's happening openly. It's just hidden in these sort of um, obscure acts that are, that are redefining what bulk mass surveillance looks like in an age where everybody is, pouring more and more information mm -hmm. into these vast data repositories online. So that surveillance apparatus gets built up during the first decade of the war on terror, more or less. And uh, the Bush administration, they play the critical role in that. Mm -hmm. That's the Bush administration. It's their decision to, you know, push through the, the Patriot Act. It's their decision to suspend normal constitutional rights so that you can spy on American citizens or make it easier to spy on American citizens. That's a Bush administration initiative, and it's a, a Bush administration of initiative with bipartisan support, I yeah. should say, or largely bipartisan support, some pushback from people like uh, Wyden and some other people in Congress who 
um, who voice objections, but largely bipartisan to create this mass surveillance apparatus using the Internet as a, a way to hoover up all the information in the world so that nothing can get past you. Because if you recall, in the aftermath of 9-11, what we were told over and over again was that this was the result of an intelligence failure. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And so their approach to solving the intelligence failure was not to get smarter. It wasn't that the CIA analysts had failed to meaningfully connect the dots in a, the sense of deliberate reasoning human beings who needed to ascertain these patterns through critical thought. No, the thinking was we just didn't collect literally all the information in the world and feed it into databases. So that's how we'll solve this problem. So that's the first part. The second part, the outward facing messaging part, really gets built up during the Obama administration, which the Obama administration, who is who really introduces the idea of data governance, first of all. So Obama has a real feel for this. There's a natural affinity between him and the kind of Silicon Valley people. They share some cultural mores and they sort of understand each other. And they share that technocratic mindset in an explicit way that understands um, the technology as a platform for social optimization, which you might also call social engineering. At the same time, during the Obama administration, the surveillance apparatus and the war on terror apparatus starts to take on a new role, which is counter messaging. So you have this very critical change where what had been counterterrorism enters this new phase that's called countering violent extremism, CVE. Hmm. And this is the growth of a, a new bureaucracy that's focused on, you know, jihadi reeducation, you might say. And like on its face, maybe that's not such a bad thing, you know. The, the U.S. ran some pretty effective propaganda campaigns during the Cold War, Radio Free Europe, Encounter mm -hmm. magazine. Like they did some good work there. Um, Encounter's a great magazine. And um, it's not clear that Encount Encounter is a great magazine. It's not yeah. clear it in any way contributed to the collapse of the Soviet Union. It, yeah, it did some enough. great literary and social criticism for sure. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's also it's not like they were actually a cutout they had right. funding from the cia yeah. but in any event my point is just that you know you could see a case for the national security establishment coming mm -hmm. up with counter isis uh, counter al-qaeda messaging in a way that's not necessarily sinister and totalitarian mm -hmm. in its implications mm -hmm. in this event and what actually happened to the obama administration was that you built up a uh cve counterterrorism bureaucracy that utilized the surveillance methodologies developed during the war on terror in order to begin counter messaging these jihadi groups while developing the infrastructural and political framework to legitimize the idea of mass messaging through surveillance for non-jihadi groups. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit hard to trace all of that evolution, but I, what I'll say is that the people who were recruited into CVE had some of the, the progressive ideological um, foundations that maybe made that transition both a, not so difficult and also appear not nefarious, but like a natural extension of what they were doing, which was improving um the kind of political hygiene of people on the internet um and is yeah. this what you are referring to when you talk about hybrid warfare this combination of conventional warfare with uh informational warfare or is there something more to that term this would be one of the tactics that comprises the, the sort of assortment of tactics that uh, define hybrid warfare. Hybrid warfare refers to conventional and non-conventional means occurring simultaneously. So both over, you know, regular uniform troops and irregular, um, you know, maybe special operations soldiers in civilian uniform accompanied by a heavy emphasis on 
um, informational and influence operations, also sometimes called fourth generation warfare, mm -hmm. has a sort of similar meaning in this context. Absolutely uh, a part of that and a part of the larger organizational transformation in the U.S. and NATO defense establishment away from building up conventional military strength and towards seeing these informational operations and these digital or, or internet-based aspects of hybrid warfare as being essential to the future of warfare. Um, and and that, that really, you know, it's building for a while, but that really becomes the dominant framework after 2014 when you have this series of events, Russia's invasion of Crimea, mm -hmm. the Euromaidan uh, movement in Ukraine, and the ISIS capture of Mosul and declaration of its caliphate in northern Iraq, all three of which involve very public, overt social media campaigns that are, you know, really sort of spectacles that are hard to turn away from, even and perhaps most of all, ISIS broadcasting its brutality yep. on social media, it is so captivating as a spectacle that I think it leads uh, many people in the defense establishment to, including, you know, not that I was part of the defense yep. establishment, but as a reporter at the time and as a former, or I guess I was still in the National Guard then, but as, a, as somebody who had served in Iraq in the army, you know, I also, I think, overestimated in 2014 when I was writing about this, including a piece explicitly about uh, ISIS's social media campaign where I quoted Clint Watts mm -hmm. on the effect of uh, social media. I think I was also overestimating how significant this was at a time and I, mistaking the ability to captivate attention or to command attention um, with military efficacy. And this is one of the maybe confusions or ambiguities inherent in the sort of attention economy is that we, yeah. we have a bias towards overestimating things that capture our attention. Yeah. yeah this is why Coney, uh, you know, Coney is gone, right? Coney 2012. <laughs> right. Uh, we solved that because we recognized it as a problem. And then we ran a lot of hashtag campaigns and put soldiers in Africa to take care of him. Uh, let, very quickly, as, as we go to the uh, towards the end of this, and we definitely want to talk about where we are and wh what does all of this stuff look like going forward. But just very quickly, Jacob, you, you mentioned a couple of biographical facts. How old are you? I'm 42. Okay. And you served in Iraq in 2006 and 2007, in Afghanistan in 2012 as an Army intelligence officer that uh, you know, kind of papers over a lot of detail and nuance. Why did you um, Why did you serve? What was your um, impetus for joining the military? Well, I was an American in a time when America was at war, and so I thought that it was my obligation to serve. I mean, there were other reasons, but probably none is um, probably none did more you, important than that. Did your commitment to Americans? America's kind of foreign policy establishment or the or the ruling class and the ruling party establishment come out of your service intact you know not your not your love of America or anything like that but could you just talk a little bit about what you saw in Iraq and Afghanistan and how that affects how you think about the ways that you know um, strategies to contain uh, you know, Islamic extremism or anti-American attitudes or anti-democracy and anti-human rights attitudes, um, you know, that have now come home. Uh, you know, what? how did your experience change your appreciation for that? Yeah, I would say it demolished it. Um, mm -hmm. It demolished a sort of uh, baseline presumption in the competence and good intention of the stewards of American policy, um, yeah. which which I held at the same time as I, you know, I, some of the best people I've ever known in my life are uh, guys I serve with in the army. So um, I, I had both of those experiences. But, you know, in Iraq, I it's, it's strange to say because I it was in a lot more physical danger in Iraq and I was there during the surge. But uh, sort of because of that, 
I was almost more of a spectator to the political aspects of it. And, you know, I should say I never viewed it as my job to solve uh, the politics of any of this. I, mm -hmm. I, because I took for granted the basic competence, um, civic mindedness um, of the leaders, the, the, the nation's leaders, I didn't, didn't invest too much time in thinking about it for myself. Now, I, I mean, I certainly, I, I thought we'd gotten Iraq very wrong. I thought mm -hmm. that um, things had gone very wrong. I thought that there was a lot of stupidity and incompetence and delusion. And I probably thought all that before I even deployed to Iraq. I mean, I think by the time I deployed to Iraq, I, had, I already thought all that. But I thought of that in, in um, like, decent people making catastrophic mistakes sort of way, not just decent morally, but fundamentally sound yeah. people making catastrophic mistakes in Afghanistan, where I was in a, you know, in relative terms, a much safer, much safer part of the country, a sort of safer period of the war, less immediate physical threat. I could see the sort of, um, both the lies of the war and the um, strategic nihilism of the war up close. Mm -hmm. So I could see the lies of the war insofar as we were all sending up reports about the training of the Afghan security forces that were absurd. Um, and we had to send up those reports because it was only by certifying that the Afghan national security forces were trained to a certain degree that we could sign off that this tranche was ready to transition, which meant that the U.S. could get out of there and, and, and hand it over. Though, of course, what ended up happening was, was you know, they, those tranches got transitioned on whatever timeline was determined by people way, way above my level. Anyway, I should say, I mean, I was in infantry battalions the whole time, so I didn't have any access to any high level anything. But uh, but I saw that the way I saw the ways in which um, baked into the reporting and the public messaging about the war, because, of course, the public messaging about the war is we were always going to turn the corner. We only needed another year in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And um, and simultaneously, the training of the Afghan National Security Forces became the sort of all important overriding imperative. And I saw that that was based on deliberate misrepresentation, uh, perhaps even more than delusion. At the same time, I witnessed up close this vast bureaucratic structure created in Afghanistan, State Department agencies and non-governmental organizations and a million and one contractors. I think people hear military contractor and they immediately think Blackwater and mercenaries. But, you know, the vast majority of the contractors that the U.S. hires in war zones are folding laundry, preparing food or even even the more uh, specialized one, because those are people we tend to recruit. Those are third country nationals, as they're called. They're Bangladeshi uh, mm -hmm. citizens who we bring in or they're, they're from uh, any number of countries who we hire in to do these jobs. Then there are, you know, the, the military trainer experts or whatever, uh, civil authority experts mm -hmm. we brought in to, to teach Afghans about how to structure a police organization or all of this was being done in a country that had no organic coherence from one province to another, where the idea of the nation state was not simply foreign in the sense that they didn't believe in it. It was foreign in the sense that most people had never heard of it had no organic connection to it, where the real lines of connection were drawn along kinship and clan and to some extent ethnicity and religion. And, and I should say that all of that also was not hard to figure out for a reasonably aware person who took a helicopter ride and looked at the terrain in Afghanistan. Because if you saw what it looked like and if you understood how physically cut off and connected these places were from one another and how that had not been 
that had not been bridged by technology in Afghanistan yet. There were not these globalizing technologies there, even though cell phones were starting to become ubiquitous while I was there. It wouldn't have been hard to understand why somebody in Paktika or Kandahar didn't necessarily have any direct connection to what was going on in Kabul. So I saw all of that. It was extraordinarily, um, you know, disillusioning and disheartening. Yeah. But even when I came back from Afghanistan, I, I saw the war as being, you know, and, and also I, I should say all of that was being done to no strategic purpose. Mm -hmm. There was no reason to be in Afghanistan. We were there was no vital strategic interest in remaining in Afghanistan for two decades. And and the real perversity is that precisely the bureaucratic waste and void that I'm describing with programs like opium eradication that we mm -hmm. pumped tens of millions of dollars into only for opium uh, yields in Afghanistan to be at their highest yeah. levels as we were leaving. All of that was then, that was the true reason we were in Afghanistan, right. was to continue these programs that we had started. And um, and that sort of machinery that, that the defense establishment lived off of and that various uh, sort of connected, even if quasi um, non-military uh, agencies lived off of that's what we were we were really doing there and it was just easier to stay than it was to leave less politically costly mm -hmm. but even when i left i sort of viewed that as a, a horrible waste but i didn't see it as necessarily um it, it, speaking to the same conditions that were endemic across the entire political system so it was a process of disillusionment uh, thank you for uh, talking about that. And you've written uh, deeply and movingly about your military experience. Uh, people should uh, look for your byline scattered, you know, particularly at Tablet Magazine, but elsewhere. If we can bring this kind of back home to where we're going, because, you know, one of, one of the things that you talk about in the story, which I think is really important, is that, you know, these kinds of apparatuses, technological, cultural consensus making, you know, uh, surveillance apparatus and mentalities and mindsets, they get developed for particular moments in time, sometimes well-intentioned, sometimes effective, oftentimes poorly intentioned and, and ineffective. But then they outlive, you know, the, the thing that gave, you know, that conjured them into being. Um, can we talk a little bit about now that the kind of attempts to surveil information flows and understand, you know, what was going on, radicalization in Central Asia and, and, and the Middle East and whatnot, now that that has come home and it's sitting here, um, what are the ways that we kind of change that? So, you know, how do we make it more visible and how do we, um, you know, how do we dismantle uh, this type of apparatus, because, you know, the ruling party, ruling class now tends to be a kind of centrist left uh, or centrist liberal uh, perspective. There's no reason to believe if for whatever reason we become a center right country again, you know, uh, the 80s are reborn and something like a Reagan coalition comes into power. They're not going to be interested in dismantling this. Right. Because they will be able to use it to maintain their kind of control. What do we do? I do think there's a sort of special synergy between um, progressivism, not liberalism, mm -hmm. but progressivism and, and techno surveillance states. They, mm -hmm. they do share certain important things in common that sort Can of. Can you talk a little bit about them? I mean, is what, what is that? Is it that individuals are, are stupid or prone to being, you know, gulled into the wrong decision? So they need yes. to. Yep. Yes. What else? Uh, it, faith in the expert class, a, a faith in the idea mm -hmm. that um, things uh, converge towards singular, correct um, outcomes or decisions that can be discerned through technical processes. You know, so inherent in the sort of let's call it the original idea of liberalism was an idea of the incompatibility of ends. Mm -hmm. Right. And so liberalism is a liberalism is a means by which societies deal with 
irreconcilable cl- conflicting differences right. and the 30 and years different wars. yeah different visions of life right i mean it, in an american context yes. the point of politics is not to reach a consensus it's to create a system by which people who disagree on very important things are able to live peacefully right right yeah and now and you're saying like in a certain kind of progressive mentality that's out the window because no there is a right way to do this there is a right way to do that this is moral that anything else is not right well nick when it comes to eradicating white supremacy can there really be two ways right when it comes to um when it comes to the vaccine when it comes Mm -hmm. to the entire every lie thousands millions of lives are at risk can there do we do we really have to um allow for disagreement over these you know if genocide is on the table or or mass extermination is on the table we have no time for this so yeah i i but i but i that's a quibble i agree with 95 percent of what you said and Mm -hmm. i agree that you could easily see a center right um government making great use of all of this while Mm -hmm. also subscribing to some of those same sort of progressive technocratic okay. underlying ideas um sort of or premises um look in terms of what we do about it um i leave that to others for the most part I, my own feeling is that there's too much and it's too big and um you know we need decentralization we need there's just it's not global information dominance is not something where you want to have a more benign or a more democratic version of global information dominance. You don't want global information dominance. It is Mm -hmm. itself. It is the problem, not the application of it or the ideological superimposition on top of it or, or the corruption of the people running it. And so I think that, uh, I think that, there's a pretty good basis for how the United States should be run. And, um, you know, I, I, not to sound like I'm not an originalist, but I just, mm-hmm. let's not throw out the constitution. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I'm both not an originalist and I'm also somebody who feels perfectly comfortable saying in a non snarky or, or uh, sarcastic way, let's not throw out the constitution because there is a real, expert led consensus around the obsolete that the the idea that the first amendment is obsolete now so So, i would say the first amendment is not obsolete and we should protect the first amendment and um but yeah I, i beyond that you know i'm um I would like politics to get sane enough so that I can go back to writing novels and not yeah. feel like I'm missing anything, you know? Uh, could, you I, know? Uh, could I ask Zach, uh, because we, we talk about this a lot and, you know, Jacob, I mean, your analysis, both, you know, it captivated both of us. And I really think everybody should read this article and think it through. And I tend to agree with, you know, most of it, but Zach, you know, we, on an almost weekly basis, we're often charting, uh, you know, the, the moments when people are escaping centralized control and people are able to live their lives more according to how they see fit. And we talk, uh, Jacob, a lot on you know this uh, show and elsewhere about things like Bitcoin, things like Noster, um, even Blue Sky, but where it seems as if in many profound ways we are decentralizing power and information and whatnot. And Zach, I'm, I'm curious to you, do you agree with uh, Jacob's pessimism um, in terms of, you know, clearly he is describing something real and that yep. is governing us, but are you as, as pessimistic as he is? Um, I mean, I, I take everything he's saying as a warning that uh, if there's not some kind of counteraction, serious counteraction taken, that things could get really bad in this new system of governance, uh, whatever that exactly is, takes shape, that it, it's not going to be the the America that we all want to live in. Uh, you know, there, there was one audience question that I think kind of gets to this point. Um, you know, Jacob mentioned decentralization. Um, FM here says the internet is the new printing press. The elites are scared because the people are having access to information 
once reserved to a few. A fascinating part of the article that uh, that I, I liked from Jacob was that the kind of history of the internet. Uh, and we, we talked a little bit about it before, how it, it started as this kind of defense project. Uh, and, but it, at the same time, there, there's always been the kind of libertarian Silicon Valley ethos. Uh, but part of the DNA of the internet may have been to kind of police social movements from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're just stuck with the fact of technology always being a double-edged sword. And we have to try to use the edge of the sword that is useful to mm. kind of undercut the the weapon that would you know result in oppression. And uh, I think decentralization is exactly the way to think about it. And th those tools are out there, whether it is uh, you know cryptocurrency, just encryption generally, um, the the decentralized networks that are emerging are they have been designed in a way to be resistant to exactly the kind of at scale moderation or manipulation that has occurred over the past decade that we've just been talking about. Um, the question is, will enough people start migrating away from that in time? And I think that is an open question and it's one that we can help answer by bringing all these issues to light because people need to know what's going on in order to react to it. It's what, what you, the yeah, said. I, I think that that's basically right. I mean, I, I think that the, there is a real danger from the internet and a, applying this label disinformation was a way mm. of sort of, capturing and corralling that danger and redirecting it but the danger from the internet is is like the commenter said that it disrupts this um hierarchy of uh and mess but you know when you printing press again first sequences of the were unbound in the kind of objective Consciousness and the emergent modern nationalism, we understand it, and also very, very wars and yep. the, the of of the, the first pamphlets and mocks and mm -hmm. and war nationalism, which were extension printing press. You know, this like, clue in formulation is that is mm -hmm. certain aspects already of man they they accentuate and build the characteristics that are inherent to human so one act of the human personality gets magnified and amplified while another is attenuated different technologies work on different characteristics yeah. of the human and we saw how the printing press worked and it went through a very uh very bloody phase and then led yeah. to this resolution which was liberalism in effect yeah. And and the attempt to sort of put the genie back in the bottle, that's what disinformation is in a sense. It's it's the attempt to put the genie back in the bottle to recapture the kind of elite consensus that had previously existed and had allowed for this top down messaging control and which was itself largely a product of these previous technologies, television and radio broadcasts. And that simply doesn't exist anymore. That world is gone and we have to make our way through this new world without trying to put the genie back in the bottle. Right. I mean, I mean, I, you know, uh, I was thinking as you were talking, you know, it took us hundreds of years to get used to the printing press and what that meant for human organization and, you know, both experimentation and a, a kind of developing of radically different ways of living. And then we had to come up with a way to, you know, to let people live more peacefully. And you get liberalism, which is not simply a political philosophy or structure. It's also it's an attitude towards life and towards pluralism and tolerance. And it seems in in a, in a many ways, and in, in some of my work, I talk a lot about this, like we really only got comfortable in America with free expression 
in the very late 1950s. Uh, you know, before then, you couldn't even fucking publish Lady Chatterley's Lover without being sued or brought into court. And, you know, we finally settled that. And now the Internet comes along and disrupts things even more. So we might be looking at another, you know, 500 years of disruption. I mean, I certainly hope not. And I do. I agree with you that looking at the disinformation mindset and the hoax, you know, that you talk about in your article um, is an attempt to, you know, it's, it's a sign that the elites are losing control, but they can do a lot of damage, right? They're going to lose in the long run. Uh, information maybe doesn't want to be free, but everything escapes the lab and, you know, starts doing, individuals start monkeying around with stuff in all sorts of ways that is interesting and, uh, you know, and ultimately triumphant. But that's the issue. The, uh, you know, I guess the final thing that I want to say, and then maybe we can wrap up, but the other um, part of your story, which I think uh, listeners should really think about a lot is, you know, at the beginning of the global war on terror, and I wrote a piece in uh, that came out in the December 2001 issue of Reason about the new Cold War. And it was fascinating to see how both George Bush, but also Donald Rumsfeld, who, you know, people kind of forget now because he died and he was, you know, uh, her, he was an architect of two massive failures in American kind of foreign policy or history, both, you know, when he was part of the Ford administration, but especially uh, part of the uh, George W. Bush administration, he very much called things, you know, that the global war on terror was a new cold war and that it was going to help us supply us with a national purpose, et cetera. And rattling around there, which I think a lot of people have forgotten, especially if they don't remember the Cold War, is that the Cold War was not simply about foreign policy. It was a structuring device that influenced every aspect of American life, including the way the media operated, the way it taught sports. Uh, you know, I mean, boys in America had to learn chess, you know, in order to because we, we were in an all out war against the Soviet Union, who were great at chess. We had to learn classical piano, blah, blah. You know, like we had to take them on every aspect of our lives that had seemingly nothing to do with foreign policy got structured by the Cold War. And Jacob, I think, you know, one of the things that your article does and your writing in general does by calling back to that period, it kind of, it reminds us that the global war on terror is kind of over, but it remains a structuring device that ha is influencing a lot of what we do um, without even realizing anymore in the same way that the Cold War and that mentality persisted, you know, after the fall of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. I guess, um, you know, do you want to give a, a final statement of, um, you know, where, where are the places either in history or in, in current events or going on right now where you see a bit, uh, you know, some room for hope? where we might actually come to terms with this kind of stuff more quickly and more efficiently and more peacefully than, um, than we might have 100 or 200 years ago. Well, um, I think that's a brilliant point about the, uh, the Cold War as a, a structuring device. And, you know, it sounds like you, you understood that a few decades before um, I started to grapple with it. But I... I I think that's very astute and that the way in which the one transitioned into the other, the way in which the cold war transitioned into the war on terror and the war on terror has now transitioned into the, um, into the war against disinformation speaks to how critical that structuring device is. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one of the, one of the things I realized that with all of these things, I'm usually, you know, I'm wrong a few times before I start like groping my way in a, a sort of drunken stumble towards being halfway onto something. And, you know, when COVID first broke out, I was like, let's lockdowns now let's lock mm -hmm. down. And I, and I really thought like, ah, oh, this is an opportunity for the state to do something and be competent. And ironically, I was probably too influenced by right-wing weirdos on online who had been hyping up the threat of COVID at a moment when the sort of center-left press was saying it was racist yeah. to be worried about COVID. And so I was too swayed by the kind of, um, you know, and like in a technical sense, reactionary thinking. And I, mm -hmm. 
I just thought, ah, oh, well, if, if the Washington Post is trying to censor this and these guys are saying it's the worst thing ever, it must be the worst thing ever. And what I what I learned six months later, or probably more like two months later, actually, was any technology of social control introduced under the pretext of emergency becomes permanent. Mm. Always. It's a universal rule. So lockdowns as a technology of social control are introduced in a state of emergency. They will recur. This is not the last we've seen of them. Mm -hmm. Any technology of social control becomes permanent. And um, that doesn't really address your question at all, but it made me think of that. It's a good, uh, it's a good, uh, but sober note to, uh, to end on for sure. Yes. uh, um, Thank you so much for joining us, Jay. Uh, I, if this stream has not convinced you to read the article in full, I, I don't know what will, but yeah. please check it out. And anything uh, bylined with uh, by Jacob Siegel is definitely worth checking out. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Nick, for the conversation. And thanks for everyone who tuned in. We will be back here next week, same time.